Thank you for downloading from the BBC. For details of our complete range of podcasts and our terms of use, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts. Hello and welcome to Global Business. And this week, another chance to hear last year's programme with a cautionary tale that we are all caught up in, in one way or another. What's it going to be like to live in a world grown old? Would you like to write a cheque for us? Yes, please, yes, yes, rather. <laughs> do, you, do you know how to write a cheque? I do, I okay. use a chequebook all the time. Getting old means getting set in your ways. Many elderly people find money difficult with passwords to remember and cards to find. They prefer signing cheques to using computers. This is a digital pen and this is a chequebook. You can write something to me if you like. My name is John and you can pay me whatever amount you want, actually. A million pounds, John. Yeah, yes. Okay. The only difference is, is at the end you'd have to just tech this authorised transaction. transaction box. Yep. And did it vibrate? Yes, it did. It did. At the Culture Laboratory in the University of Newcastle in the north of England, they're experimenting with ways to change checkbooks, which many banks want to get rid of, into devices that look and work just like checkbooks, but deliver electronic data, the kind the banks now want to use. Professor Mark Blythe is an interdisciplinary specialist at Northumbria School of Design, and he's got insights into how rethinking the checkbook can satisfy older bank customers. There's a camera in the pen which photographs the movement of the pen and then turns them into data which can be translated yeah. to your bank yeah. straight away. So whatever but, you're writing with that pen appears on the computer screen. And it. this has the actual data that is used to do the transaction in the yeah, pen. Exactly. You bamboozled older persons into thinking they've written a cheque when in fact they've generated the data for a transaction. Yeah, honestly, it's impossible to bamboozle them. It's not that they're technophobic, it's that they're technocritical. So, they're you know, grumpy old men and women, aren't they? Quite. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I sympathise, I'm one myself. Yeah, 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 yeah. What's happening in Newcastle is more than just a curiosity. The world is growing old, at least many significant parts of it are, growing old at an unprecedented rate. Increasing longevity is good news, of course, but with it comes great big problems, and some of them go to the heart of the way we've run our world for the past hundred or more years. It's a huge subject, one that will be cropping up in more than one future edition of this programme. Newcastle University is a place which is deliberately turning itself into a world centre of excellence on ageing as an issue in many disciplines, including design, as we've heard, also medicine and engineering. One of the moving spirits behind this strategy is Professor Tom Kirkwood of the University's Institute for Ageing and Health. The starting point that most people have in their heads when they start to look at what's happening is to see it as a problem. People talk about the grey tsunami, the ticking time bomb of demographic change, the burden of all these older people. What that viewpoint rather misses is that we're dealing with what is humanity's greatest success. We have achieved over the last 200 years the extraordinary feat of doubling, doubling the number of years that the average person can enjoy during their life. Now, that has come about through untold ingenuity in so many areas of human endeavour, and yet we seem to be stuck in a mindset that sees it as a problem. Now, it brings challenges, to be sure it brings challenges, but for goodness sake, we can use the same ingenuity that's given us these extra years of life to get to grips with some of these challenges. More later from Tom Kirkwood. It's a new balance of power, weighted by old age. Listen to Avis Gallagher, a volunteer in Banbury in the south of England. We always think, oh, there's going to be lots of old people. How depressing is that? But we shouldn't look on it like that. Yes, there's going to be a lot more old people, and yes, there's going to be a lot more need, but there's going to also be a lot more older people who want to get more things out of life, who are going to be healthier, fitter, and whereas in the past it was families who looked after one another with our families spread all over the world, if you want the same sort of fulfilment as you did looking after the family, you look after older people. George Magnus is an economist who's thought very hard about the huge demographic changes many big countries are about to experience. 
this is a unique phenomenon for human beings in all of our history. And it is a slow glacial phenomenon with dramatic consequences. So it's not breaking news on a day-to-day basis, but it is nevertheless of huge importance. George Magnus is economic advisor in London to the investment bank UBS and author of a book called The Age of Aging. He says that two huge population trends have combined to produce a momentous impact. Many people all over the world are living much longer than they've ever done before and some big countries are shrinking because they aren't having babies. We've never had a period in our history when we've had this combination of weak or declining fertility and rapidly rising longevity. Sometimes we've obviously been through periods like the Black Death or Global War when obviously large numbers of young people and middle-aged people have been killed for one reason or another. But these two phenomena of fertility and longevity are unique in our history. What it really means is that we're not replacing into the working age population, which is broadly defined as being between the ages of 15 and 64. We're not replacing the productive workers who are moving into retirement and spending record numbers of years in retirement. This is the downside risk of societal ageing, which is the economic consequences arising from a shrinking or stagnant working age population. George Magnus says the financial impact on ageing will be huge. Britain is just one example. To give you an idea about the scale of what this is all about, if we were to estimate in today's money the future amount of all of the government's existing obligations for healthcare spending, pensions and long-term residential care, it would roughly amount to about five times our national income today. So this is bigger than the banking crisis and the budget crisis that we're in as a result of the banking crisis. This is a very big shift. It is a big shift. And and certainly compared with the financial crisis, this is altogether of a different magnitude. It's not just economists who are concerned about ageing. It's the job of actuaries to advise organisations, private and public, on the likely future demands on pension funds. Despite this vital role, actuaries have been rather taken by surprise on how we've all gone on and on growing older decade by decade and how we still are, putting pressures on the pension funds, the companies whose earnings finance the funds and the tax system. The man who first drew my attention to this many years ago is the former British government actuary Christopher Dakin, so I got an update from him the other day. From a purely financial point of view, it is worrying because we are asking people to be sustained over long periods of retirement, a period which is getting longer and longer, on the basis of what people would like to see as shorter working lifetimes. But in order to finance these long retirements, you're going to need a later retirement age, you're going to need more contributions whilst people are working, a more efficient pension system, and good ways of spreading out that income over the retirement period for as long as people need it. And yet one looks at retirement through very much the rearview mirror of the past, what your parents had, that's the sort of reasonable retirement age, 60, 65, it ain't going to be so in the future. We won't be able to afford that, will we? Uh, certainly not, no, and I, I can't imagine that that will be the norm in, in 20 years' time, but it's hard for people to get used to that idea of, that it will be much later when they've had that idea that with increasing wealth it will be possible to take earlier retirement. Chris Dakin, former British government actuary, a trustee director of the company Now Pensions and an independent trustee. A big economic problem then, but not just a problem. Listen again to Tom Kirkwood, who's Associate Dean for Ageing at Newcastle University. The increase in life expectancy that's emerged over the last 30 years was a complete surprise to governments around the world. And the exciting thing, and it it really is exciting, although many people see this as very threatening, at the moment, life expectancy is not slowing its rate of increase. Life expectancy is increasing by between two, two and a half years for every decade. But what that actually means 
is that your and my life expectancy today is going to increase by between five and six hours. So, you know, when the alarm clock went off this morning and I got out of bed, conventionally we think of ourselves as waking up to a 24-hour day. But the reality is that we're waking up to a 29-hour day, of which we're going to use 24 hours now for the, the conventional day. But we're putting another five hours each day onto our stockpile for the future. So at Newcastle University, they've been spending much time and effort creating a new research platform across the academic disciplines focused on the many needs of an ageing population. It's something special. Based on medical work, including studies of the brain that have been going on for decades, the university has now widened its focus to embrace many of the concerns that are going to loom large in an ageing society, from the care we'll need to the chairs we'll sit on. Tom Kirkwood, tell me why Newcastle University has singled out ageing for such attention. Ageing is hugely complicated, and to look at something which is complicated, you need to bring to bear the complementary skills to look at the facets of the problem. We've been doing a study in Newcastle over the last five or six years, which is really relevant to this. We've been conducting what we call the Newcastle 85 Plus study, and the idea of that was that In today's world, we know that people 85 and older are the fastest growing part of the population, but we know almost nothing about them. So we were able to approach, starting in 2006, people who had all been born in 1921, and we got about 1,000 people to take part in the study. Now, among the many things that uh, we were able to do with their participation was to look at the illnesses that they had. And we looked for whether they had or did not have any of 18 different diseases of ageing. And what we found remarkably was that out of the 1,000 people, first of all, at age 85, there was not a single person who had nothing wrong with them. But most people had four, five or six things wrong with them. And so medical services need to be reconfigured as far as we can to take account of the fact that older people have lots of things going on together at the same time. And the way that you treat one of these conditions may have to take account of the other ones that are present. Tom Kirkwood at the University of Newcastle in the northeast of England. This is Global Business from the BBC. I'm Peter Day, this week assessing some of the strengths and weaknesses of growing old. So I press the log button, it comes up. Now, blood pressure, I'll go for that one first. So, yes, that's my blood pressure for the 14, 15 days, you see. Terence Munro is measuring his blood pressure at home in Newham in East London. He's in his late 60s and he's part of a big trial of telemedicine which ageing people will probably need if society is going to afford elderly health care in the future. Terence suffers from diabetes and he's landed in a hospital in the past. Now he's able to check his blood sugar level, blood pressure and weight each day at home. The data is fed via his cable TV set to a centre staffed by healthcare professionals, and the system can respond to out-of-the-ordinary readings from Terence with a series of individualised messages and advice, or the professionals can intervene and respond in person. Terence Munro told me what the coming of telemedicine meant for him. Freedom, absolutely freedom. I used to go out walking, I love walking, and um, being diabetic... I didn't really know how high or low my sugar was. Let's go out walking, let's get going to eye poles. Now I know what level I've got to be before I can go out. So you test your blood sugar like this? I do. Usually I get up in the morning, put the kettle on, weigh myself, blood pressure and blood sugar, and when I finish that, the kettle's just boiled. So it's a matter of minutes to do the lot, see? So it's, and it's all Bluetooth, and it goes straight to the television, which is fantastic. Right, it goes straight to the straight to the digi box and it's flashed to the nurses in the centre. Exactly. So you know they're looking after you all the time. So they're watching you from afar. We call them the angels, because they was there. It's like having a doctor or a nurse in the house all the time. Because if there's anything wrong, they're on you straight away. So you know you've got more freedom to do things. Well, it gives me life, doesn't it? Also with us was Yvonne Fenn, the lead nurse for this telehealth service. She's been working on it in Newham since the experiment began in 2008. Quite different from her old job, I suggested. It is a complete change from how I've done nursing over the years. I mean, I'm a district nurse by background. Used to go in patients' homes, 
monitoring patients that couldn't get out that are housebound with their long-term conditions. How many uh, an hour can you do? Oh, you can probably on maximum do 10 to 12 visits a day. We're managing on a daily basis in my, in my centre at the moment just over 200 patients. And how many people? Two people. They're two healthcare support workers who monitor my patients and then if patients fall outside of their parameters, it's then fed up into the normal primary care services. And if you haven't had it on a particular day when it's been arranged, a warning bell rings because you haven't got the information in. Uh, yep, we have what we call a clinical interface on our end and if patients haven't done what they're supposed to do or if we've had an abnormal reading come in they go red we have like a red amber green system and patients that are red get prioritized for our nurses to attend to this is a different way of thinking about healthcare, isn't it it is a whole new way of thinking but it's also helping us manage this change of our society that is coming and we're all going to need looking after in some way but we're not going to have the human resources to do it. And it's in people's own homes and that's enormously important, isn't it? It is and we're keeping our patients independent. That's important for everybody. Responding to big demographic shifts, many businesses are now getting intensely interested in the implications of ageing. The equipment in Terry Munro's flat came from the electronics giant Philips. It was one of many companies participating in a very large British government-funded pilot study to discover how technology can help people manage their health and keep their independence. Eric Sandy is the man in charge of home monitoring at Philips Healthcare. He told me more about the study. The most striking figure that came out of it was there was a 45% reduction in mortality for the participants in this program, which is really striking if you think about the magnitude of that. Some of the other findings, there were 20% fewer people admitted into emergency, 14% fewer visits to A&E, 8% reduction in tariff costs. And so an ambition that's been stated by the Prime Minister and the Minister of Health is to have 3 million lives touched by telecare and telehealth by 2015, which would make that the most ambitious telehealth program in the world. And I can tell you that other healthcare systems are watching this very carefully. But unless this stuff happens in a productive way, governments in many countries are not going to be able to cope with the burden of an ageing population At some stage in the ageing, probably people will be all right for a long time, but at some stage, as you live longer, you become some kind of health problem, don't you? Certainly. uh, By some estimates, about 25% of the cost of care happens at end of life, and about 80% of the uh, cost of the healthcare system goes to people with chronic illness. So it's, it's very focused on those individuals. So society just will not simply be able to afford to, to cope with that. The other issue, too, is we're going to run out of clinicians. We just cannot produce enough doctors and nurses to deal with the massive wave of demography that's headed our way. So we have to find ways to make them more effective and focus on the really high-value activities where they can bring their expertise to bear. Because we're also finding patients are essentially healthcare consumers now. They don't just salute the flag when the doctor tells them what to do. They come in with a foot of Google printouts. And they may be misinformed, but they're certainly more informed than they were ever were in the past, and they want to participate in their health care. Eric Sandy of Philips Healthcare with some fascinating results from the important British study called the Whole Systems Demonstrator Research Project. It'll probably have a big impact on the way we think about old age care, but questions are being asked about the price of the equipment and how cost-effective telecare is going to turn out to be. There's much more to be discovered. Five and one... One thing that an ageing population will need is some kind of companionship, and that puts an intense spotlight on volunteers in centres such as this one in Banbury in Oxfordshire. One of the newer volunteers is Avis Gallagher, who retired from her care worker job when she was 60. Why does she now do something rather similar as a volunteer? When you work, you have a role in society. You know what your role is. When you retire, you have to find a niche for yourself, something that helps you find your role to the sort of person that you are, the things that you enjoy doing. When community care started, we never thought about people's social needs. We never thought about the need that, yes, it was lovely to send somebody in for half an hour to get their lunch, 
But we didn't think about they needed conversation. To have any quality of life, you need social interaction. And that's the sort of things that are so expensive. And that's the sort of thing that volunteers can do because the one thing that we have is time, the most useful commodity there is, and that's what we have got lots of, is time. You don't mind awkward old people, do you? Not at all. I love old people. I mean... And, no, I, but awkward I, ones, grumpy ones, you well, know. Well, that shows they've still got some spirit. They've still got some life. Right, your next number, two and six... The centre is run by an organisation known by its initials, the WRVS, set up just before the Second World War. At one stage in the 1940s in Britain, there were more than a million members of what was then the Women's Voluntary Service. Now there are only 40,000 volunteers, but it may need far more as Britain ages. David McCullough is the WRVS chief executive. When he met me in Banbury, I asked what kind of services over 60-year-olds need. Generally, people have broadly similar requirements. And when you talk to older people, the starting point, when you talk about what changes the quality of their life, it's obviously their ability to be able to pay for the things that they need and their health, but actually right up behind that is their sense of social connection. It's about not being isolated. And so the sort of services that everybody wants are about connecting up with people. And there are lots of little tasks that go alongside that, like getting a meal or going shopping or visiting a centre, but actually what it all boils down to is being connected to somebody else. It's about about having a chat. It's about being a human being, not somebody who's just surviving in an environment. The WRVS insists it's wrong of us to think of over 65s as dependent people. Recent research at Commission showed huge positive contributions in the form of spending power, family help, volunteering and other good causes. David McCullough says it's important that the older generation is seen in the round rather than just as a problem or as a drain on the state. At the moment, between the combination of tax, spending, volunteering, commitment to the community, then actually there's a contribution from older people to the economy that's worth about £40 Now, you can chop around at the edges of that, but it's a very, very substantial number. And more importantly, when we look at the way the demographics are changing, that contribution is going to rise from £40 billion to about 80 billion over the next 20 years. And you're at the front line of change because there are going to be many, many more old people needing your kind of services in the future, the next 10, 20, 30 years. Yes, that's right. And and I think one of the things we need to try and do is to sort of change the discourse about this. I don't think that there are thousands and tens of thousands of people who are creating a devastating problem. I think there are lots of people who want to continue playing a part in society, who want to be connected to society. But we need to get back to something like 1947 with a million volunteers, don't we? Yes, absolutely we do. And the faster we can get to that, the, the better it will be. We do need more volunteers. There's I mean, no not, just, not just a nice song. It's not just you talking your book. This is going to be an absolute necessity in running a functioning Britain. Yeah, this is a real-life problem, and we have to address it. But I don't think people will be averse to doing that. But I think we have to shift the mindset from saying the solution is about professionals in systems providing all the answers to, no, it's not. It's about communities with different skills, different experience, different abilities to spend time with people. And if we work together, we could actually create a much better outcome. David McCullough at the WRVS, The Volunteers. This is a huge issue with big implications for global economics, politics, healthcare, life in general. But to sum up so far, let's return to two British experts on ageing. First, the economist George Magnus, author of The Age of Ageing, who wonders when governments are going to start worrying about all this. The cynic in me probably assumes that we have to wait for something to happen, whether it's a kind of a a damning report about the incidence of pensioner poverty or about growing numbers of people that are retiring without any savings, something 
like that will happen and then that'll become the catalyst for some major change of or thinking on, on the part of the government. I don't really see at the moment, particularly with all the distractions that we have to do with the aftermath of the crisis, any real willingness to take on a new structural problem. When that happens, if that happens, it's going to be a bit late, isn't it? Well, it is. I mean, our advantage, when I say our, I mean, the advantage that Western countries have is we have levels of economic development, which actually give us huge advantages by comparison with emerging countries. We can afford to drift. To some degree, we can afford to do this and still make good in five years' time or ten years' time. It's more painful to do it then than it is now, but we can do that, probably. And then back to Professor Tom Kirkwood at Newcastle University, now in his early 60s. Are you, I asked him, tentatively looking forward to getting older? It's a complex question. I I enjoy getting older. One does have a different perspective. There is an inevitable sadness about the ageing process that one has to face up to the fact that ultimately this terrible ageing process is going to kill me and it's going to kill the people that I love and I'm not too happy about that. But I don't let that crush me. I'm pretty optimistic that humanity is going to get it, maybe dragged kicking and screaming into a sort of better recognition of the issues. It would be lovely if we could move forward in a well-planned, well-coordinated way. I doubt very much whether that's going to happen. It doesn't usually happen that we adapt to changes in a a well-prepared, well-planned way. But it is so important, and it affects every single one of us, that we simply have to get to grips with the challenge. And I think if we can find mechanisms that would sort of bring out the positives and that would also empower people who are older already, who have so much to contribute in our society, not just in the sort of the traditional sort of volunteering and looking after the grandchildren ways, but through the energy, the creativity, the drive, the business forming opportunities, all of those kinds of things, we will all be so much better off for it. Professor Tom Kirkwood at Newcastle University, thinking about getting older, as you do at a certain age. There are dozens of different podcasts now available from the BBC, including news, documentaries, science, business, arts and sport. For details of them all, go to bbcworldservice.com slash podcasts.